I'm reading from NRSV, and the Bible reading for today is Mark chapter 1, verses 9 to 11. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. All right, we'll test out and see if technology works for us today. I have to say a couple of things. One, uh, last night I had plans of taking my PowerPoint and making it into something a little bit more interactive, like I did last week. And I came to the church because I can't do it on my iPad. And um, last night the church had no internet. So um, it won't be quite as interactive with that, um, but we'll see how we go. One of the things that I'm going to be doing well, actually, before I say that, um, I also want to say, some of you might be looking at me going, huh, he's a little casual for a pastor here in just a t-shirt. <laughs> there is a reason for this, and later on you'll look at my shirt and go, oh, that's the link that Mike is making with that. So there is a reason for that. But I also realized, when you wear a t-shirt, there's no place to stick the mic through. So if you get a little bit of the beard noise on it, I apologize. Other shirts work better for this type of mic. So anyway. Last week, I was working with you guys a little bit on a couple of things that for me are very foundational with Jesus as the center of our faith and how does that work, how does that connect, how does that affect how we view God, how does that we view scripture, and then how do we work as that thinking about us as a church, how are we a Jesus-centered church, a center-focused church. This week, we're going to get a little bit more personal and be talking about us and also our view of how we look at other people. And we're gonna jump into this. So centered in the beloved, and I'm gonna have you go to the next passage, I mean, next one here. And here I don't have a clicker, so I'm gonna be constantly telling him to move on. So this is the passage that we just read. And I was gonna have you do something interactive with it, so this time I'm just gonna to have to have you call out. I want you to look at that passage there for a minute. What stands out to you? What jumps out at you and says, ooh, that's kind of interesting. What do you see in that passage? The heavens torn apart, okay. Yep, what else do you see? The spirit coming down, yes. So, it is interesting that we think about the New Testament is a lot about Jesus. Well, really, it's also a lot about the spirit. And almost always, when Jesus is starting stuff, the spirit is there sort of kicking off things as well. So here we have the spirit coming in, and then Jesus kicks off his ministry after this. So yes. What else do you notice in that passage? Like a dove. Like a dove. Okay. Okay. God is pleased. Yes. God speaks. Yes. Now, one of the things that you guys haven't said yet, but I want you to take a note of here. Who is it that's observing this? Jesus. Jesus. The first time I read this was like, did he tell everybody about it afterwards? I mean, who else, who else saw this? It's saying that Jesus observed it, but I'm assuming that others did as well. So let's go to the next slide here. Here's a bit of a picture of what's going on here. Here we have Jesus who is given this title as the beloved. Now, I looked a long time to try to find a non-white Jesus for this one. <laughs> I couldn't find anything, but this was my favorite ones of the ones that I did see. So this is the one story where Jesus is named from God as the beloved. Now here's where you get to grab your Bible or think of your Bible knowledge. Where is the other story where God names Jesus as the beloved? Okay. Transfiguration, ooh, points to, yes. There's a reason we have him as the youth worker here, yes. Very good, let's go to the next slide. So this one, I was able to find a little bit more diversity here. Here we have the transfiguration, and it's interesting, the wording here is very similar. There's a voice that comes from God and says, here's my beloved son, I'm pleased with him, 
And then there's an extra line added. Does anybody know what that extra line is? Listen to him. And it's like, oh, gee, huh. the disciples didn't get it the first time. Listen to him. So here he is. Jesus is named as the beloved. And with this, this isn't just a, uh, a word saying, oh, you know, I love him. This becomes a title for who Jesus is. Jesus is the beloved of God. That title carries on and is throughout the New Testament. And the other day I went through and looked at all of the places where that word is in the New Testament, in the Greek, and there's several different ways that it is translated, but it doesn't just stay with Jesus. As we have union with Jesus, it becomes part of us. So let's, let's jump here to the next slide. So this is, there's two different ways that often our Bibles in English translate beloved, and there are two different words slightly in the Greek. The one is a greeting. So often you'll be reading things like Paul, and Paul will say, oh, to my beloved son or to my beloved brother so-and-so. And that one is much more a greeting. And it's a slightly different way that this word is in the Greek. But there is this other one where it greets people as, you are the beloved. And that one's not just, oh, I feel good about you, I like you, you're my good friend, you're my beloved friend. No, this is a title that is given, same to Jesus, and also to us. Let's go to the next one here. So this is one of the places where it is given. Now here I'm going to have you grab your Bible and I want to see what other words are here instead of, so this one says, this is 1 John 4, 7. Beloved, let us love one another for love is from God and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. What I want you to do is grab a Bible and look at that first word. What does yours say? Not often does it say beloved in different translations. What word is there for you? Does it say beloved in yours? In that one? In the Pew Bible, it says beloved. Okay. Are there other ones? Hey, I'm liking this Pew Bible. Yeah, good job. Often it says something like, dear friends. Do we have somebody who has a Bible? Dear friends? Okay. Yeah. Is there any other translation that's like that? My beloved friends. Okay, well there, again, is similar to this dear friends, beloved friends. Those are misinterpretations of it because it starts saying, oh, you know, this is a close friend of mine. Where this is a title, and this title carries some meaning to it. And it's not just that this person is close, but you are the beloved of God. And I'm going to take this thing off. I keep catching myself with it. <coughs> and here's where I'm going to make the link with my shirt. Do you know what the next verse says? Whoever doesn't love doesn't know God, for God is love. Now, a key thing with this, it's not God is loving. Because wouldn't it be nice if we had a God that was just loving? Oh, awesome. But no, no God is. It's part of God's DNA, part of God's identity, not just how God behaves. God is love. And for me, that is central to my concept of who God is, how God interacts with us. So much so that not only do I like the shirt, God is love. If you've looked at my arm, I have it tattooed on me. My bottom part here says, for God is love. Oh yes, how awful for me to... <laughs> Explaining this tattoo so you know what it is, there's some reminders that I keep for myself. The first one says, speak no evil. The second part says, seek wisdom. And the last one is, for God is love. And for me, these are reminders that I need to keep with me, so much so that there are times I say things and my wife's like, Micah, read your arm. Oh, yes. <laughs> Speak no evil, right, yes, God is love, yes, okay, I'm with it. Yes, I can't wait until you guys get a chance to meet my wife. But here we go, we have this title of beloved. Let's look at the next one here. So this is Strong's uh, Concordance, which when you're looking up Greek words, it's a good place to go to and find out some of its meanings. And it shows here the Greek word there with some of the different endings that it has. There's two main ways that it's used, and that's what it's getting at. Let's go to the next one here. This is the part that is about Jesus, a title of the Messiah Christ as the beloved be 
beyond all others by God who sent him or who sent Jesus. Now here's the key one is we're going to go to the next one. What's that one say? And about Christians as beloved by God, Christ, and one another. So there is this concept, this title, that it's not just a greeting, but we are God's beloved. So you're like, okay, Micah, great. Warm and fuzzies, what do we do with that? So we've already talked about Henry Nouwen. Let's pull up this, this next slide. This is Henry Nouwen. He is a great author and a theologian. The one picture there is the typical one that you'll see if you look at his book or something like that. The other one I kind of liked, he's on his skateboard. As an older man, I tried to learn how to ride a skateboard until in Kansas, uh, a little pine cone blew underneath of that and a pine cone that gets under a skateboard, the skateboard stops and the person on top usually doesn't and I no longer longboard. But Henry Nouwen has this great way of talking about the beloved and explaining this and he, one of the things he says is we often spend, we have a short life and we spend it looking for who am I. Let's go to the next slide. So here he says, who am I? And then he says, most of us identify ourselves by three things. And I've added a fourth one after working with young people for a long time. And I want to go through these with you. And I want you to think about, do I do this when you're thinking about who I am for you? Okay. So the first one he says, who am I? The first one he says, most of us define ourselves as, I am what I can do. Or as we get later on in life, we look back and say, this is what I have done, and I'm known by those things. So what I can do, or I have done. This is one of the ways that we base our identity. And I brought a Frisbee up. This is a huge part of how I often do life, is every Thursday, I'm out playing Ultimate. Most people know Mike's got a disc, he's playing. This is who Mike is. I sometimes define myself and I have to catch myself because if I have a really good day playing, man, I ain't made an awesome throw. I'm feeling really good about myself. This last week, I was feeling really good about myself. All the guys are much younger than me. They can run much faster than me. But I threw about eight out of the 14 throws to the end zone. I was feeling really good. Defining ourselves by what we can do. Let's go to the next one. I am what others say about me. Oh, this is a huge one. But it's not just, for a lot of us, it's not just what other people say about us, but we often get in our heads saying, I am who I think other people think I am. Let me try saying that again. I am who I think other people think that I am. But this is often how we define who I am. What's this last third one here? I am what I have, and this includes not just the stuff that I have. We often define ourselves by, you know, our phone, our shoes, our shirt, whatever, but it's also by our relationships. Now, there's one twist I've seen with this in a more modern context, and let's throw that last one up. This is me, this is not Henry Nouwen, but I am what I consume. I've noticed that it's not, you know, I have the, the coolest thing, but you know, I had this phone, then I had this phone, then I had this phone, then I had the next one, and it's more about I've consumed all these things. And unfortunately, I'm finding that often we treat relationships in the same way. I had this relationship, I had that relationship, and it's more about I've consumed all these things, and it's become part of how we identify ourselves as well. Now I want you to pause and think about yourself and your own identity. Can you see that you have built some of your identity on some of those. I can go through each one and think about different ways that I have. Now the thing that Henry Nouwen goes on to talk about is he says all of these are fleeting and very fragile ways to build our identity. For me, I've had situations where each one of those things has been stripped away from me at a different time. Early on, as a young person, I identified myself as a baseball player. I set home run records, I was feared by pitchers, I was a, a great hitter. All this weight getting behind the bat, man, the ball would just jump. And then I had a back injury, and the one thing I can't do now is swing a baseball bat. For years, my back's been trying to heal, but I still can't do it. That way of forming my identity has been stripped away. 
If I solely was based on that, my identity is in a very shaky spot. When I've moved so many times, I come into a new space, people don't know me, there's not this reputation of all these good things that I've done that are built up there, it's stripped away. What I have, how many of you have had a great loss of either a, a fire or you've had to move and suddenly all your stuff is gone? I've experienced some of that. And suddenly all the things I had are gone. So what Henry Nouwen says is instead of basing our identity and our worth on these things, we base it on we are beloved of God. Let's go to the next slide. You are beloved. <coughs> this is one of those, oh, that's an easy thing to say, but how do we actually do that, basing who we are on being the beloved? It's one of those that it's like, all right, well, I can, do I just work up warm, fuzzy feelings that I'm always like, oh, God loves me, and that's where it is? Let's go to the next one here. This is both title, it's our identity, but it also ties into our worth. And those last two, identity and worth, often trigger things in our brains. Let's jump to the next slide. With our brains, our brains don't recognize threat as difference between physical or something that would threaten our identity or our worth. In other words, if I have a bear jump out at me, rah, my brain is gonna go, Pah, you gotta react. If I have somebody question my knowledge, my self-worth, my idol, whatever it is, they're saying things that are bad about me, they're now trash talking the stuff I have or something like that, it affects my brain in the exact same way. It's amazing how you're in conversation with somebody and you say something and suddenly they're like, Rawr! and you're like, wow, what did I do? It's often a spot of going, oh, I recognize that I questioned something about their identity, their worth, and when I did, I un unwittingly triggered that response from them. It's a little bit harder, but almost as important to recognize when that happens in ourselves. Wow, I really jumped on that person for saying that, why? Oh. I realize that that's part of my self-worth. I hold that as part of my self-worth. For me, I've had to do this very practically a number of times where I've gone into meetings and I knew they were going to be questioning some of my decisions, some of how I'd worked with young people, some of who I viewed God to be, and some of my worth. And in, in a very practical way, I stopped and said, my worth isn't in what they say. It's not in my reputation. It's in I'm beloved of God. And when I talk about being centered in the beloved, this is where I'm talking about very practically. For us, if we can get it that we can say, my worth, my value is in God's love for me. Then when we're interacting with other people and they're attacking or questioning or something about us, we can sort of say, yeah, but this doesn't change my worth. My worth, my value, who I am, is I am the beloved. And when God says for us, love your enemy, and they're attacking us, how do we not react back? It's that is not changing my worth, my value. My value is I am the beloved. I want you to grab onto that, because I think that is so foundational for us as Christians. We as followers of Jesus, we are taking on Jesus' mantle as the beloved, and when we get that down into us, very practically, that's our worth, that's our value, then we can meet other people where they're at. And it's not about our identity and our worth, but it's about who the other person is. And we can truly be with them. So this being centered in the beloved, us, our identity, our worth, is key. But the fun thing is, we don't get to just stay there. So let's jump quickly to the next slide here. This is Greg Boyd. He is a uh, teacher, pastor in the US. I started following him because uh, he went to a church and he started teaching about Jesus and over a thousand people left because they didn't like the way that he was teaching about Jesus. Then he taught about uh, nonviolence and how Jesus is the Prince of Peace and another thousand people left his church. And I went, oh my goodness. But he stayed true to who he saw Jesus was and love and nonviolence. And he is a pastor at a megachurch, and yet he still keeps preaching this God of love. And I'm like, ooh. 
in one of his sermons, and this isn't a direct quote here, because I couldn't find it exactly. I've been listening to him for 10 years, and I didn't go through 10 years of sermons. But he says something like this, very similar. Until someone invites us into their lives to work at discipling them, we as followers of Jesus are allowed one opinion of others, that they have unsurpassable worth and that Jesus died for them. This is the way that we are invited to engage with other people. And often we're like in the church, we're like, oh, but we're in the church, we can also, you know, correct somebody. Until that person invites you in on their life, trying to correct them doesn't work. So I think he's got a lot of wisdom here as when we are approaching other people, until they invite us in to do discipleship work with them, we have one opinion we're allowed. They have unsurpassable worth and that they were worthy of Jesus dying for them. And I think this is key on how we engage with other people. Every person we met, regardless of who they are, this is how, this is our opinion that should be of them. And I don't know about you, but I have to work at this quite often. It's something that I have to go back to. I meet somebody, I'm like, ah, I just want to, you know, wait a minute, Micah, catch yourself, read your arm. Let's look at the next slide here. Oh, and you're going to have to click. Okay. This applies to all people regardless of who they are or what they've done. Let's go to the next one. They are the beloved. And the last one. So we must treat them as who they are, the beloved. This is a daily reminder for me. But if I am centered in me being the beloved... I also have to interact with every single person, regardless of how they act, regardless of how they believe, regardless of how much I think they're messing up other things or hurting other people, I still need to treat them as God's beloved, centered in the beloved. I want to go to one last one here. This again is from John, and here it is again, this title to us, the beloved. Beloved, if God so loved us, We ought to love one another. This is the call for us as followers of Jesus, to build our identity, to center ourselves in who Jesus was, and that title passes to us, we are the beloved, and then to treat others that way. I'm going to throw one last slide up here. I had some fun. We are the beloved. I love that photo of you guys. It's awesome. Let me pray for you, and we'll wrap up here. So let's pray. God, I just want to thank you for being a God who is love and who engages with us in love and cares for us in all the troubles and the strife that we have. Help us to truly get it on the inside and help it to be the core of who we are, our meaning, our value, who we identify as, as that we are the beloved. And as we go and we interact in the world and the world beats us down, attacks us, insults us. Help us to get our value from that space of you love us. We are your beloved. But God, also help us as we engage with other people, as we struggle, remind us over and over again that every person we meet, every person we see, every person we walk past, every person we are in conflict with, they too are your beloved. May we act more and more like your son. May we act out of your love, and may we bring your love to the world. Partner with us in that. Fill us with your spirit, and go with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.